At the start of your security career, you will just follow orders. But eventually, you will make decisions. When you become a senior security professional, you need to understand the big picture. This is more than understanding your capabilities and limits, and it's more than understanding your coworkers. You need to understand how systems succeed, and you must understand how systems fail. Learning this takes years, so it's best if you start early. Teach yourself to analyze both success and failure. Look for patterns. Look for commonalities. And as you do, you should notice a few things. For example, systems almost always follow their incentives. It's hard to fix a broken system if the guys in charge benefit from the broken. And in our field, the success or failure of most attempts at secure implementations are usually predetermined by their environment and goals. Simple environments that protect short-lived stuff of low value are usually secure. Complex environments that attempt to protect high value stuff for a long time are routinely subverted, hacked, redirect, and compromised. It's not that we can't protect valuable stuff. If we create a simple static environment, we can create security. But most attempts to ignore the complexity and just charge ahead usually fail. So the easy answer is, <laughs> if we want to succeed in security, all we have to do is avoid complexity. Uh, avoid constantly changing environments, like the internet, or government, or business, or family, or dang near anything that involves money. <laughs> Unfortunately, most real world systems look something like this. This isn't unusual and it isn't unexpected. It's just the way people and systems tend to evolve. So when you are in the hot seat and you need to make security decisions, if it's worth protecting, it will probably be at least this complicated. The trick is, not all complexity is the same. Some can be compartmentalized, some can be ignored, and some can be simplified. So let me outline some helpful common scenarios. In other videos, we'll provide suggestions for how to improve security in different environments, but the rest of this video will be devoted to the most common scenario, which is make it worse. There is no situation so dismal, awful, and dire that you can't make it worse. Sometimes we choose to make it worse, sometimes we do it in ignorance, sometimes we have really good intentions, but many of our common approaches actually decrease security. For example, we decrease security by choosing fake security. Real security comes with unavoidable expenses. You can always buy the appearance of security for a lot less than real security. And if you don't care about consequences, then fake security is a bargain. Needless to say, if you value your profession and you find yourself in a situation where the decision makers are choosing the appearance of security and they're also disclaiming responsibility, you should get out as quick as you can. Speaking of responsibility, we also decrease security when we diffuse responsibility for outcomes away from actors. Security only exists if everybody works together to create it. If we say that one group or one person is responsible for creating security, 
then we make it impossible for security to persist. Just saying something like, I am responsible for security, will greatly increase the likelihood of a security failure. The vast majority of security decisions are always made by others. Our most effective efforts will always be to help others make better security decisions. Another way to use this principle and decrease security is to choose to stop security efforts once we achieve regulatory compliance. We excuse it by saying that it is irresponsible to overdo security, but <laughs> When we stop at regulatory compliance, we surrender our responsibility to create security. And at the same time, we blame some remote, unknowing, uncaring regulatory body for all our inevitable failures. Another common approach to decreasing security is to enable unfavorable outcomes. In IT, we are trained to create general systems and general solutions that freely interact to achieve almost any goal. But extreme capability destroys assurance and safety. Most of the possible outcomes are bad. In order to increase assurance, we have to eliminate unfavorable outcomes we have to constrain behaviors. So we've actually decreased security if we stop once a critical system works the way we want. At that point the system creates more attack surface and more attack incentive. You don't actually improve security until you go on and reduce the capability of the system to betray your interests. But that takes a lot of work. Finally, one of the best ways to decrease security is to fail to understand attack incentives. There are two battlefields in IT security. Beginning battles are waged against automated indiscriminate attack. These attacks begin when an attacker launches code against the internet. These attacks end as, as far as you're concerned, when your defenses fail to respond in the way the attacker anticipated. One of your basic responsibilities is to know and prepare for the current level of automated attack. If you can't handle indiscriminate attack, then you have failed to achieve minimum acceptable security. Your systems will be compromised within days, if not hours. Almost all of our training teaches you how to prepare for untargeted, indiscriminate, automated attack. But the next battleground is targeted attack. Targeted attack is a whole new ball game with an entirely different set of rules. Most of your training fails to prepare you for targeted attack. Today's internet environment provides regular targeted attack against everybody who has value or influence. Targeted attack begins with favorable economics. The attacker balances the expense versus the reward and if the balance looks good, they attack. Even government attackers balance expense versus reward. Targeted attack only ends when the attacker incurs sufficient expense. If the attacker is blocked one way, he'll try another, and another, and another. Eventually, he'll find some way you didn't anticipate. The only way to stop targeted attack is to degrade their reward calculation. Our training teaches us how to calculate our assets value. And then it teaches us to protect 
according to our evaluation. This seems like simple economics, but it greatly degrades our ability to defend against targeted attack. Selfish asset evaluation leaves us unable to predict or understand our attackers. To defend against targeted attack, you begin by calculating the value of your assets to your attackers. And usually the quickest, most effective defense against targeted attack is to reduce the perceived value of your assets. For example, the greatest security advance of the last decade has been the widespread deployment of perfect forward secrecy and transient session keys. Before this change, web servers usually encrypted their traffic using their private key. Before, there was a huge reward for compromising a web server. Not only did you get everything on the web server, but you were able to decrypt all of its past and future traffic. This reward was so great that many governments were tempted into widespread compromise of web infrastructure. Perfect forward secrecy improved the security of all compliant web servers all at once by reducing the reward for a successful attack. Another example, our training teaches you to create a secure enclave and then gather your valuables together within the enclave. This makes it cheap and easy to defend against a wide range of automated attacks. Unfortunately, this approach usually makes targeted attack simple and extremely profitable. Once you understand attack incentives and attack costs, you can also defend against targeted attack by increasing the attacker's expenses. But that takes time and lots of effort. Finally, at my son's request, a parable I will give unto you. Once upon a time, there was a security professional who paid a crypto ransomware demand. He had many good reasons to pay the ransom, but the criminals used his money to attack more and more people. Later, the internet collapsed for many good reasons, and his family starved to death. Then this same security professional lived on by hunting down and eating fellow survivors. Again, he had many good reasons for his choices. As you advance in the security profession, you will learn that there are many good reasons for almost every security failure. 